If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. Jeremiah, chapter 18. And let me begin by way of introduction to say that some years ago I had an opportunity to attend something that's called the Passion Play in Hot Springs, Arkansas, rather Eureka Springs, Arkansas. It was a tremendous opportunity for me because I got a chance to see firsthand what it was kind of like in that last week of our Lord. But prior to the actual play itself, I had an opportunity to witness um, a potter actually making a piece of pottery. And I was really amazed at that because I had never seen that actually up live and personal before. And when I saw that taking place, it led me to our passage for tonight. So if you're already there in Jeremiah chapter 18, we're going to begin our reading at verse 1. The King James translation reads this way. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now let me just kind of take you to the end. Sometime tonight or maybe this weekend, look at verse 12 of that chapter and you're going to see that the Lord uses Jeremiah to give the nation of Israel a warning of impending judgment. But unfortunately, verse 12 says, we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to pay attention. And as a result of that, Israel experiences the judgment of God. So I understand that the actual interpretation of this particular passage, the actual interpretation of the text is dealing with Israel's lack of repentance. But I'd like for tonight, just for a moment, for us just to kind of walk through this passage and look at it from just a little bit different perspective. Because as God has chosen Israel to be his possession, those that he loves, he's chosen us as well to be his possessions. Amen. We remember Ephesians chapter one, verse four, that says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And tonight I want us to understand that just as he chose Israel, he's chosen us. And we've been called out from the world. And the reason why we've been called out from the world, because God wants us to reflect his image. Because in many cases, in some people, the only image of the Lord that they will see, they'll never go into the doors of a church. It's going to be you and I. It's going to be our lives. Amen? Amen. And so I want you to think of the potter, and I want you to think of the clay. Now get this picture in your mind. Jeremiah walks in, and he sees three things. Number one, he sees the potter. He sees the will, and he sees the clay. Now, you need to understand that Jeremiah didn't take him long to recognize that God was using um, this picture of the potter and the clay to help Jeremiah to see that the clay represented Israel and obviously it represented Jeremiah. I mean, the will was God's tool that God was using to shape the nation of Israel. And remember, the text says, I have the right to shape the clay the way I want to. Paul even echoes this in Romans chapter nine. He says, who are you to say to the potter? Why are you shaping me thus and thus? So I want you to think of it this way. We or clay. God is the potter and his ultimate objective in our lives is to shape us that we might bear his image, that we might reflect his character to mankind. But in order to do that, there are going to be some things that we're going to need to learn. And I think in this passage, there are several things that we need to learn. First of all, we need to learn that God has the power to do whatever he wants to do in our lives. Amen? Amen. 
Let me try to illustrate it this way to you. In 1969, I joined the United States Air Force. And what I did, I lived in Kansas City, Missouri. I, I got on the bus and I rode to a place called, uh, in San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base. And when I got off the bus, they wanted to immediately let myself know and all the other men that were on the bus that now, since you've taken the oath of office, that the United States government is in control of your life. They took us and they ushered us into this room and they began to shave all of our heads bald. Then after they shaved us bald, they took us to another room and they gave us all these, this clothing and clothing that was too big for you. Then they took us into another room and they showed us this is the dorm where you're going to be sleeping for the next several weeks. Then they took us to another room on and on and on and on. Then they took us outside and they were supposedly they were going to show us how to line up and, and how to march. And it didn't take me long to recognize that I was no longer in control of my life, that now I had yielded my life for the next four years to the United States government. How long has it taken you? Are you still confused as to who's in control of your life? Or have you come to the realization that God really has the power in your life to do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and how he wants to do it? Amen? Amen. So Jeremiah needed to learn, and we need to learn, that God has the power to do whatever he needs to do, but also he has a purpose in mind. Remember that passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are called according to his purpose. And I always tell my students, it doesn't make any sense to quote verse 28 without verse 29, because verse 29 says in the King James, he says, Whom he foreknew, he also predestined that they might be conformed to the image of his son. Now, to me, that's a sobering thought, that God is doing something in our lives, but it's not shaping us so that we can be a better us. It's shaping us. He's shaping us to be a better him. He's shaping us so that when we walk outside of our doors, when we're at church, when we're at Walmart, when we're at, at the store, when we're at the, at the laundry, when we're at our kids games, he's shaping us so that when people see us, they see Christ in us. Amen. Amen. So the question tonight is this. How is he looking in your life? How is he looking in my life? And so back to this potter in the wheel. And one of the things as I'm watching this, uh, th this illustration of the potter, I noticed that as he's spinning the wheel, the piece of clay had the tendency to begin to kind of start flopping around and, and going over here and going over there. And so the, the, the clay had this kind of natural propensity to go its own direction. And what had to happen is the potter had to then take his hands, put his hands in some water, and then apply pressure to the clay. Because you see, at one point, the clay was on the center of the wheel and was going around real, real good and everything looked good. But the more he spent it, the more it had the naturalness to kind of get off center. And what he had to do, he had to take his hands and apply pressure. And guess what? Right now, God is applying pressure in your life. But it's not because he doesn't love you. It's because he does love you. And here's the deal. God knows exactly how much pressure it takes for you because the pressure for me and the pressure for you may not be the same. But guess what? Here's what I know. We all in this room have a tendency when pressure comes our way. What do we do? We run from pressure. And I'm submitting to you, I'm suggesting to you that pressure could be the very best thing that's ever happened in our lives. And so we learn about God's power. He's sovereign. Also, we learn about God's purpose. We learn about God's, uh, about God's pressure. You see, what's inside of us is what God wants to get out. See, there, there is something inside of us that the Lord knows that he can use. And as a result of that, he allows tribulations, he allows troubles, he allows trials to come into our lives because he knows that as he heats up the fire, so to speak, what happens, the end result is that pure, beautiful piece of gold. And I know, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. If he really loved me, why take me through the fire? If he really loved me, well, even why even take me through the storm? 
because it's oftentimes, and I know you can agree to this, many times the best lessons that we've ever learned in our life was while we were in the middle of the storm. Amen, someone? Amen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because think about it. The disciples were in that boat. And he knew that the storm was raging. And guess what he did? He waited until they got out into the middle of the lake. And then he came to the rescue. He wanted them to know that he was able to deliver them. But he, he also understood that they had to experience some difficulties. They had to experience some pressures. And then he let them know, even in the midst of your pressure, I'm always here. And I'm always available for you whenever you need me. Have you ever come to a point where you said the pressure is just too much? I can't handle it anymore. I know what it's like to come to a point where you think I just can't take another step. As a matter of fact, Lord, if they ask for one more paper. <laughs> if they ask for one more paper, I tell you what, I'm out, I'm out of here. I have written enough papers. <laughs> I say to people all the time, and, and this, is, this, this is funny, you know, uh, sometimes in our, in our schoolwork, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that you do this, but I can remember being in seminary, and I was so ready to graduate. Anyone ever read? I was so ready to graduate, and I knew that I needed 22 units left. And so my last semester of school, don't do this, I took all 22 And I was working a full-time 40-hour-a-week job. I got to the point where I just said, just pass me, sir. Just pass me. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that. But what happened was I got to the point where I got so tired. And it wasn't until I understood the real reason behind my tiredness. Because I got to a point to rather than doing things in the power of the spirit, I started doing things in the power of the flesh. And it just overwhelmed me. I'm here to tell you today that God has the power to do whatever is necessary in your life. And because he loves you, he is in the process of shaping you. But remember, your natural propensity, my natural propensity, what? Is to get off center and to what? To go our own way. We're like sheep and what we, we, we have a tendency to go our way. But he knows the amount of pressure that we need. So here's what I'm suggesting to you. Stay on the potter's wheel. Allow him to do in your life what he knows is best for you. I know it didn't make sense when you lost that job. And at the moment you lost the job, you just almost lost your mind. And you said, Lord, what am I doing wrong? And then you recognize two weeks later when you interviewed for that new job and they gave you a $30,000 raise. Now you know why you lost that last. But at the moment, at the moment, it didn't make any sense. That's why I'm saying because God is sovereign, because God knows what he's doing. He's doing things to what? To shape us, to mold us into the image of his son. So stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. I'm telling you, stay on the wheel. Even in those times when you don't feel like it, stay on the wheel. Allow the potter to shape you the way that he wants to shape you. When I think about pressure. Pressure can get so strong, things can explode. But even if they explode in your life, I love what one, one man said. Remember the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the what? King's horses, all the king's men couldn't. Until they met Jesus. Once Humpty met Jesus. Hallelujah. Once Humpty met Jesus, <laughs> then he recognized what all the pieces in his life. He was the only one who was able to put this together, to put that together, to what? To fix Humpty. So you're looking at Humpty. You're looking at one whose life was so fractured. You're looking at one that was so wounded that the last place I ever wanted to find myself was in a church the last religion that I ever wanted to have anything to do with was Christianity. But God knew what I needed. 
And when I was at my lowest point in my life, the Lord says, I'm going to send someone your way because I think I've, I've, I've allowed you to go through enough pressure. Because if, if I take you even further, you, you might explode. You, you, you might blow your brain. But uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send someone your way and he's going to give you the answer that you've been seeking. You've been searching for ways to get relief. You've been doing this to get relief and only give you temporary relief. Have you ever taken something to give you temporary relief? The only problem is when it wears out, you got to take it again to get relief. And I kept doing all those things. And finally, when this man came to me, he says, young man, you need Jesus as your savior. And I said, sir, I'm already a Christian. He says, how do you know that you're a Christian? I said, well, I got baptized when I was seven years old. The man hurt my feelings, guys. He said, all that happened to you, you went in the water dry and you came out of the water wet. <laughs> He said, but here's what you need to do. If you're willing right now, young man, to entrust your life into the hands of Jesus who loves you, I promise you he can make order out of all of your disorder. That night, guys, 1973, at 9.20 p.m., September the 10th, on the telephone with a prudential insurance man who tricked me because he told me he was talking to me about life insurance, but he knew he wanted to talk to me about eternal life insurance. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, if you're different than the Jesus that I saw growing up, I'm ready. Take my life. Bring order out of this disorder. I opened my eyes when the prayer was over. And so I said, sir, do I need to pray again because I didn't feel any tingle? Because, see, I was raised in a culture when, you know, you had this religious experience. You know, you shouted, you, you know, jumped some pews, you ran around, and something like that. And so I didn't feel like jumping any pews. I, I, I didn't shout. I didn't feel any electrical charge. And so I said, sir, I said, do I need to do it again? He says, young man, salvation is not based upon your feelings. He says, salvation is based upon the fact of God's word. He says, were you serious when you trusted him? If you did, according to God's word, you trusted in the finished work of Jesus. He's already accomplished what you need on the cross. And when you trust him, that's all that's necessary. That started my life of order, out of disorder, because he knew what pressure was necessary for me. Israel had to find out after 70 years of captivity what God's pressure is like. And we all know the story. At some point, the pressure subsided. He allowed them to go back into their land. But can you imagine? Can you imagine being in God's pressure cooker for 70 years? I don't want to be in his pressure cooker for seven days. But if he tells me, that the best place for me is in the pressure cooker? Guess what I've learned to say? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Have your way. So my encouragement to you tonight is this. You're at Dallas Theological Seminary, one of the best institutions on the planet. I'm proud, I'm glad, I'm honored to be a part of this faculty. Part, glad to be part of this team. And our responsibility is to train you, is to equip you. But there's one thing we can't do for you. That is, we can't live your life for you. We can only prepare you to live your life. And God has you on his will. And God is shaping you. He's molding you by all of the events that are going on in your life. And as long as you allow him, as long as you submit yourself to him and you say, Father, your will be done in my life. He knows how much pressure you can handle. He has a purpose in mind. And in the end, and in the end, I hope that you'll be able to say these words. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I've run the race. And now there's a crown laid up for me. And what I'm doing is this. I'm not even looking to the things that are behind I'm looking to Jesus. You know why? He's my spiritual track coach. If you've ever run track, you know, sometimes the coach will run around the track with you. Then at some point when you're coming around the last, the last corner, 
the coach or someone else will go right there to the finish line. Oftentimes, he has a little stopwatch in his hand, and he's waiting for you. And here's the good news. There are going to be other people that are waiting for you as well. These are friends, family members, co-workers, professors that have already run the race. And what they're doing right now, they're in the stands cheering you on that in the midst of running that you not quit. Let him shape you. Let him mold you. Because one day when you cross the finish line, here's what we all hope we'll hear. Well done, that good and faithful servant. Father, thank you so much. Thank you that we are like Israel. We're the clay in the hands of the Lord. The Lord said that he had the power. He was sovereign. He had the power to do whatever he wanted to do with the nation. If they followed him, if they obeyed him, there would be blessings. If they disobeyed him, there could be judgment. And he says to Israel, I'm about ready to judge you. But all you need to do is repent. Just change your mind, change your attitude, change your disposition. But unfortunately, they did not. They experienced judgment. Father, we're also on your will. You're shaping our lives as well. And you're saying to us, stay on the wheel. Let me shape you. Let me mold you so that you can be a reflection of me in the world. In order to do that, I'm going to have to apply some pressure in your life. But the pressure is not because I don't love you. The pressure is because I do love you and I'm trying to get the best out of your life. And even if you have a chaotic, a disordered life, <laughs> I'm the God of Humpty Dumpty. I can put you back together again. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.